Hello there, faithful listener. You've tuned in to Season 7 of the Bible Explained Podcast. So make sure to grab your cup of coffee, because today we are going to be discussing the Book of Romans. Well, hello there, guys, and welcome to the Bible Explained Podcast. And hi, my name is Jen. I am the host here. And one thing I never understand about podcasts is how come if the host is a girl, it's not hostess. (laughs) I'm the hostess of the Bible Explained podcast. (laughs) All right, faithful listeners, today we're going to talk about Romans chapter 7, verses 7 through 25 today. And we're going to be talking about sin again, but this time we're going to be focusing in on why do we keep sinning if we are no longer slaves of sin? Why is it that we still sin? Why is it that we still have habitual sins sometimes? And I'm also going to give some practical tips on what you can do if you find yourself habitually sinning. So we will be discussing that today. And actually today I'm going to be reading not out of the W.E.B. as I usually do, but I'm going to be reading from the NLT version of scripture. So turn in your Bibles to Romans 7, 7 through 25, and let's enjoy reading God's word together with a nice hot beverage, preferably coffee. Well then, am I suggesting that the law of God is sinful? Of course not. In fact, it was the law that showed me my sin. I would never have known that coveting is wrong if the law had not said, you must not covet. But sin used this command to arouse all kinds of covetous desires within me. If there were no law, sin would not have that power. At one time, I lived without understanding the law. But when I learned the command not to covet, for instance, the power of sin came into my life and I died. So I discovered that the law's commands, which were supposed to bring life, brought spiritual death instead. Sin took advantage of those commands and deceived me. It used the commands to kill me. But still, the law itself is holy, and its commands are holy and right and good. But how can that be? Did the law which is good cause my death? Of course not. Sin used what was good to bring about my condemnation to death. So we can see how terrible sin really is. It uses God's good commands for its own evil purposes. So the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know what I am doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So I'm not the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I'm not really the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. I have discovered this principle of life. That when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law, But because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. So while reading this, you might have the question, how can Paul say that he's a slave to sin in verse 14 here, when in the last chapter, he says that we are no longer slaves to sin? (laughs) Is that a contradiction? We'll talk about it. First, let's talk about verses 7 through 13. On Tuesday, we talked about how Paul was mentioning that we are dead to both sin and also dead to the law. So now naturally, Paul is asking the question, does that mean that there's something wrong with the law since I am telling you that the law is not what makes us right with God? So he says here in verse seven, well, then am I suggesting that the law of God is sinful? Of course not. In fact, it was the law that showed me my sin. And then he gives a really good example here. He says, I would never have known that coveting is wrong if the law had not said you must not covet. Now, obviously, we know that coveting is wrong. It's one of the Ten Commandments listed in in the Old Testament. Thou shalt not covet. And coveting is basically a deep form of envy. And it could even be 
envy to the point where you're starting to scheme to try to get something from somebody else, like something that you're jealous of that they have. That is what covetousness is. And this is a really good example that Paul uses because covetousness, especially, I feel like is very hard for us to pinpoint in ourselves. Like sometimes we can be really jealous of what somebody else has, but then we don't even realize that we're feeling jealous towards them. And even in the days of Jesus, the Pharisees actually taught and believed that people only sinned if they actually went out and committed a sin that other people could see. The Pharisees didn't believe in heart sins. And that is why the majority of Jesus's Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, is talking about heart sins. Jesus is saying, well, no, you're actually sinning if you do these things in your heart. For example, if you're coveting, even if other people can't see it, you are still sinning because that's the sin of jealousy within your heart. So yeah, once again, this is a great example that Paul uses here because covetousness is so hard for us to pinpoint. So then Paul says, but sin used this command to arouse all kinds of covetous desires within me. If there were no law, sin would not have had that power. Now, earlier on, Paul had mentioned that people who lived before the Old Testament law existed technically were not breaking the law because there was no law for them to break. So Paul is kind of using the same concept here where he's saying, you know, sin, the sin within ourselves didn't have laws to break until the Old Testament law came around and told us that it was a sin to do these things. So then sin had a heyday with that and was like, oh, these things are sins. All right, let's do even more of them. <laughs> it's basically what Paul says here. He says, at one time I lived without understanding the law, but when I learned the command not to covet, for instance, the power of sin came into my life and I died. So I discovered that the law's commands, which were supposed to bring life, brought spiritual death instead. And that is because sin was aroused when it heard about these commands. And it was like, you know what? Those things are sins. Great. Let's go ahead and do them. Sin took advantage of those commands and deceived me. It used the commands to kill me, is what it says in verse 11. But still the law itself is holy and its commands are holy and right and good. So just because our sin nature causes us to sin when we hear commands that are good, it does not mean that those commands are bad. It just means that we are bad and we are using those commands to do sinful things, basically. That is Paul's argument here. Verse 13, but how can that be? Did the law, which is good, cause my death? Of course not. Sin used what was good to bring about my condemnation to death. So now we can see how terrible sin really is. It uses God's good commands for its own evil purposes. So now Paul goes into this idea of being a slave to sin, even after we have been freed from sin. And you might be like, well, Jen, how can that possibly be? Like, how can Paul be a slave to sin when he has been freed from sin? When the entire last chapter that we talked about, Romans 6, was literally just talking about like being freed from the bondage of sin and how we should never go back to serving sin again. How can we still be a slave to sin? So it says in verse 14, the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I'm doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So he kind of goes back to the idea that the commandments of the law are actually very good because people are trying to follow them. Even people who are not saved try to follow the moral commandments of the Old Testament, even if they don't realize that they're doing it. Every single person on earth, of course, has a conscience and knows the difference between right and wrong. People know that it's wrong to murder. And that was an Old Testament law that God gave to the Israelites. So everybody knows that the law is good because they try to follow it. But yet, because they are slaves to sin, they cannot follow that Old Testament law, even though they agree that it is good because they are trying to do what is good. So even people who say that they don't believe in the Bible, if they are trying to be moral and they are trying to be good, they are actually agreeing that the Old Testament laws are good. <laughs> Just to let you guys know about that. So he says in verse 17, I am not the one that was doing wrong, but it was the sin living in me that does it. 
Now, this does not mean that Paul is not taking blame himself for what he does. But he's just saying that every single person on earth was born with a sin nature. You were, I was, every single person on earth has the sin nature. So the sin nature that lives inside of us is always trying to get us to do what is wrong. And as Christians, we have the choice to follow that sin nature or to follow what we know to be true, which is Jesus. Verse 18, and I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. So right here, Paul is not blaming the sinful nature. He literally says nothing good lives within me. So Paul is taking the blame. He's not just being like, oh, my sin nature caused me to do that thing. No, he's saying nothing good lives inside of each one of us. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. (laughs) I mean, how true is that for all of us? And personally, I think that Paul is not specifically talking about his old days as being a Pharisee here. I think he's talking about the then and now that even though Paul is following after Jesus, his sin nature still gets in the way. And that is true for every single one of us. We can be freed from the sin nature. We no longer have to be a slave to sin, right? We don't have to follow sin's commands any longer if we are Christians. But oftentimes people will get entrapped and enslaved to sin once again, even after they are Christians. In fact, Paul kind of um, briefly mentioned that in Romans chapter six, the chapter before this. And I'm going to turn there real quick and read verses 15 through 18. Paul says, well, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean that we can go on sinning? Of course not. Don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Thank God. Once you were slaves of sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey the teaching we have given you. Now you are free from your slavery to sin and you have become slaves to righteous living. So, I mean, Paul, even there was saying that whatever you choose to obey, you become the slave of. And I believe that even includes Christians. I think every single Christian can be caught up in becoming slaves to sin once again. That includes me. That's why we still sin to this day. That is why, you know, once we believe in Jesus, we don't just become sinless and perfect. In fact, um, John mentions that in one of his letters. He said, if you think you are without sin, you are lying to yourself. (laughs) Every single person has sin whether or not you believe in Jesus. But once we become Christians, we have a choice. We don't have to follow after sin again. We no longer have the obligation to have to sin, if that makes sense. Now we have help from the Holy Spirit to guide us onto the path that leads away from sin instead. Now, just a quick rabbit trail here. That's actually one of the reasons why I don't like the first verse of This is Our God by Phil Wickham. Because here's what it says. Remember those walls that we called sin and shame? They were like prisons that we couldn't escape, but he came and he died and he rose. Those walls are rubble now. (laughs) The walls of sin and shame are not rubble. In fact, they're very well up and standing in each of our lives. And so God, when he died and rose again, he didn't just like tear down those walls of sin and shame so that they're completely gone. Instead, it's more like he gave us a key to get out of the walls of sin and shame. So we have access to that key at all times, but sometimes we can instead go back into the walls of sin and shame and lock ourselves back in. (laughs) So that's why I don't like that song. Just to let you guys know. Rabbit trail. Going back to Romans seven though, Paul is saying, you know, He wants to do these good things, but he's doing instead the opposite of these good things, which every Christian finds themselves doing from time to time. And it's the sin nature that's within him that is still doing those sins. He says in verse 21, I have discovered this principle of life that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. 
Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? I think that that is so amazing. You know, Paul was so humble. He's like, this sin nature that's still inside me is warring with my mind. It is annoying. It is so frustrating. And he says, what a miserable person I am. I just absolutely love the humility that Paul had. But the point that Paul is making here, which is very important, he is making the point that in our own power, we cannot stop sinning. When we are doing things in our own power, we are not going to be able to do what is right. Because that's what he says. I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. This is implying that Paul had been trying to live for God by his own power, but he could not do it. He could not do it. And that's the same for you and me. When we are trying to live in the way that God wants us to live in our own power, we're not going to be able to do it. We have to rely on God. That's why he says in verse 25, thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. He is the only person that's going to be able to free us from a life that is dominated by sin. So if you find yourself habitually sinning quite a lot, and you are just feeling so guilty after you are habitually sinning and you can't seem to stop, then I highly recommend two things. First and foremost, you need to have a very active prayer life, very active prayer life. Maybe go on a walk with your dog or by yourself and just take that time to pray. Take that time to pray. You're going to find that when you go on those prayer walks, you're not going to want to stop walking. Like after you're walking for a little bit and you're praying, you're just going to want to keep going. And then you'll find yourself like taking a 40 minute walk and walking way further than you wanted to because <laughs> you were just in the groove of your prayer life. So I highly recommend just finding ways and opportunities to maximize your prayer life. And the second thing I recommend for you is to get the book, The Steps to Freedom in Christ by Neil T. Anderson. It is very cheap on Amazon and it's a really, really good resource to have. I recommend actually everybody get one regardless of what you're struggling with because something in that book will speak to you. And it goes through guided prayers and the prayers are all very excellent. It's just an excellent resource to have on hand. And I find myself going back to it quite a lot myself. So those are two things I recommend if you are struggling with habitually sinning and you're having trouble just relying and leaning on God to help you. Perhaps you're, you know, focusing too much on your own power to stop those habitual sins, but you have to focus on God more. That is the only way you can get away from some of those habitual sins that you are struggling with. Faithful listeners, I hope you liked today's episode. And if you did, share it on your social media platforms and tell people that the Bible Explained podcast exists. And if you know somebody who you think today's episode might help them, share it along to them. Well, anyway, guys, I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day and I'll see you tomorrow for another episode from the book of 2 Samuel as we are talking more about the first years of David becoming the king of Israel. So tune in then 6 a.m. or whenever you choose to wake up. But faithful listeners... Happy listening and God 